16th of February, crucially Sunday, predictably hungover, disastrously 12.55 p.m. and still in bed. Last entry is 2.15. This will be tight. My feet sneak up on my brain and swing themselves onto the floor before the brain gets a chance to stop them. Suddenly, and quite offensively, I'm up and fumbling around for my bag. I sense my body feels somewhat vindicated in causing this offence, given my at best inconsiderate treatment of it over the past 24 hours. Fortunately, my room being the size of a generously proportioned matchbox, I'm able to find and fling into my bag everything I need and get out the door for just after one. It'll take an hour and 10 minutes, according to City Mapper, an hour and 15, according to the date my stomach's just set behind my back with the Greggs on the high street. Pastry in hand, and increasingly all over my t-shirt as well, I stumble past loud people and shiny people, and I'm sorry I don't have any change people, and under the ground and onto the train. I feel a bit weird about eating here, I still haven't quite figured out the etiquette on this. And most of the time, it's almost impossible to distinguish dirty looks from just looks in this city, more so underneath it, so they're no help at all. Once finished, I crumple up the paper bag and stuff it into my pocket. I take off my coat. I get off at Kennington to change. It smells like vomit. I reapply coat. I get on the thing going to High Barnet by a bank. During all of this, the noise in my earphones, which is maybe music or maybe a podcast, but it's mainly just noise, saves me from sharing this time and space with anyone else, or with whatever thoughts my brain, my brain might put there if given the chance. It rarely is anymore. I see that other noises are providing this service for other people too. I switch my brain out of standby at each stop to read the sign on the platform and check how many more I'll have to read before Kendish Town. At one point, someone else starts eating. I look around to see how others react. Predictably, they don't. I study the eater. How long has he been here? Does he know the rules? Could he be knowingly breaking them? Is that the true sign of a native? How long does it take to become one of those? Do other people think I'm one? Someone asked me for directions the other day. I was able to give them, which made me feel like, yes, I am, but almost certainly I'm not. The escalator at Kendish Town is particularly long and steep, or are they all as steep as each other? So definitely not a native then. Left side, as always, mystified, as always, by the people standing still on the right instead of walking up. Why would they want to spend any more time than necessary doing this, being here? Maybe they like it. Or maybe they think the effort of walking up the escalator isn't worth the time it saves. I think that's probably it, but I'll never ask one of them to check. I walk past the two pubs beside each other and watch a group dither before going into the worst one, idiots. While observing, I forget and consequently miss the 88 bus. Idiot. I check City Mapper. Quicker to walk now. 25 minutes, but I'll do it in 20, I think. That'll get me there two minutes before it closes, I think. Is it definitely 2.15? It changes sometimes. When does it change? I decide not to check, because I don't know what I'll do if it turns out I'm not going to make it. I just decide that I will, and that's that. I join a crowd waiting at a set of lights to cross the road. None of them have pressed the button. Why does no one here ever press the button? They all assume someone else will. I don't do it. It would seem arrogant or passive aggressive. I look across to the corresponding crowd on the other side, waiting to swap with us. I notice a woman slightly older than me, wearing brightly coloured gym gear and earphones, and crying, very obviously crying. It strikes me as strange that this is happening in public. Stranger still that, along with everyone else, I'm doing nothing about it. More strange than that, the absolute strangest thing of them all is that I know I won't do anything about it. I am absolutely certain of that. I think about what I would say to her if I was going to do something about it. Say if I was at home and she was the only other person on a country road. Or maybe even just if there was no one else at this crossing. I think in that circumstance, it would be more uncomfortable to do nothing than something. But there are people here, people who would see. So never for a moment does this thought leave the realm of my imagination to become, to become anything practical that could inform any real life action. I notice that she's looking everywhere except eye level and realise it must be to avoid making eye contact with anyone and disrupting their day with the burden of her sadness. I think about how awful it would be if I accidentally made eye contact with her and then realised that actually we both just immediately look away from each other and pretend it didn't happen so it wouldn't be that bad. The light goes green and I bolt to the front of the crowd. Walking makes me warm and the coat comes off again. I realise people must think I'm strange charging around in a t-shirt on such a cold day. 
and then delighted in remembering that I don't know any of them, so I don't care. I turn left onto the heath. It's all prams and dogs and smug couples pushing and pulling them. I must, look, I must look like an imposter to them without my own evidence of domestic settlement. They're all walking so slowly, showing off how little it means to them to be here and how little they feel compelled by anything other than a casual Sunday afternoon whim. It seems impossible to me that these people have work tomorrow morning too. I arrive with two minutes to spare. I fumble around for pound coins for the machine and scurry down the slimy steps into the roofless changing area. Six or seven others provide examples of the various stages of the process. Some are still dry, with faces that evidence the seriousness of their mental preparation, while others jitter around, bright-eyed and wet-haired, with towels and shaky hands, re-familiarising themselves with the intricacies of buttons and zippers and belts. A silent camaraderie prevails. One man, fully clothed, walks to the centre of the changing area, forcefully rings his trunks over the drain cover, and, once they've spluttered out their last watery breath, folds them into his bag and strides away. I half convince myself that'll be me in ten minutes. Once changed, my feet splat over puddled concrete, past the goading blackboard, water temp temperature 4.7 degrees Celsius, and onto the jetty. Beyond the floating perimeter, swans and ducks flaunt their comfort where I know I won't be finding any. Beyond them, the grey glass of the surface inhales and exhales against marshy banks that rise up to verdant hillside and noble trees whose stillness seems to speak of their exceptional manners. Within the boundary, only the lilting rhythm of a singular figure's breaststroke reminds me, barely, that I share this space with others. I step to the edge, inhale and jump. What feels at the time like the worst 30 seconds of my life is followed immediately by what feels at the time like the best 30 seconds of my life. Immense fragility and powerlessness dominate the former and I then wrestled with and cast away in the latter. This struggle occupies my mind entirely and I relish the sim simple singularity of purpose. My body adjusts because my brain allows it to. They share a transformed mutual impression of each other that I'll hold on to for a week. Vulnerable to invincible in under a minute. I smile, I swim. Thanks very much, Gillian. Magnificent. Um, where are you telling us a story from tonight? I'm in Akadui in County Derry at the moment, but oh, okay. I'll be going back to London soon. Oh, okay. How long have you lived there now? Uh, I've, so I moved to London last September um, and then oh. came back home just before yeah. lockdown. And then I'll oh. be going back again next week. Going back over soon. Wow. Yeah. What was it that prompted you to tell a story at 10 by 9? Uh, so my mum's actually done a couple of them before, yeah. um, Linda, and I kind of had an interest in writing for a while and, and wanted to mm. sort of find some new ways to put some things I've written out there and this seemed like quite a good way to do that. Fantastic. Well, yeah, we told one, there's plenty more to come. So we're looking forward to more from you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Look forward to hearing more from you.